I am ready. Uh, Lady Gaga is the first song. You, you got that? Okay, yeah. okay. Okay. Stand by. Good job. If you're ready. I'm ready. Here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one. Welcome to the Jeremiah Show. We are so thrilled to be broadcasting today from the incredible, absolutely stunning Woodshed Recording in Malibu, California. I'm actually looking out the window at the Pacific Ocean right now, and uh, it's just beautiful. Woodshed Recording has hosted such iconic artists as Coldplay, U2, John Mayer, Barbra Streisand, Sting, Harry Styles, Lady Gaga, and Pink, and that's just to name a couple of them, a few of them. Owner and visionary Richard Gibbs built Woodshed to offer composers and musicians a place to escape into their creativity and record music without distractions high above the Pacific Ocean. Woodshed recording was designed by renowned architect Akai Yang mm -hmm. to be first and foremost a creative environment that takes full advantage of the inspiring ocean views and the breezes. Woodshed has boutique instruments and the finest equipment available, completing the recording experience. And it was almost lost on November 8th, 2018, when the Woolsey Fire ravaged the landscape in Los Angeles and Ventura counties. The fire burned 96,949 acres of land. The fire destroyed 1,643 structures, including Richard's home. It killed three people and prompted the evacuation of more than 295,000 people. Richard lost his house, but miraculously and incredibly, Woodshed Recording was spared from the fire and the flames. I am joined today by owner Richard Gibbs and special guests. My special guests are Mariel Hemingway of the Hemingway, Mariel Hemingway Foundation, founder and co-founder Melissa Yamaguchi, Ava Lynn, singer-songwriter. She was just on this season of The Voice, did really well. <laughs> Welcome, Ava. She's our artist here today. Uh, and her and Heather Dawson, who is founder. Are you editor-in-chief? <laughs> You're everything, right? Wear a lot of hats. <laughs> she does it all, and uh, it's California Life HD. Mike Gormley of Los Angeles Personal Development. And then I want to give a big thanks to Josh, uh, Marco, and Richard Dugan for sound and audio and video. You guys are, have done a great job. Uh, welcome. And welcome, Richard Gibbs. Oh, I welcome you. <laughs> this is my place. I welcome yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, uh, uh, I meant to tell you, I was hoping we could trade keys or something. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful spot. Um, so tell us about the fire and how was Woodshed saved? Whew. Um, that's, that's a two-hour story all on its own. Yeah. Uh, the fire hit, um, my wife and I were here until 15 minutes before the fire actually hit our property. We were watching it come up over the hills. Obviously, it was a massive fire. Uh, by the time it started in the valley, by the time it crested the mountains here in Malibu, it was 14 miles wide. Wow. It was a massive fire front, the biggest that had ever hit Malibu by a country mile. And uh, we saw it coming up over the hills, and it looked like it was going to miss us. The prevailing winds looked like it was going to blow it out north of us, west of us, over mm -hmm. Zuma Beach. And We have some photos we're going to show. Yeah, uh, so yeah. that uh, obviously did not happen that way. Uh, but we were preparing as quickly as we could for that. Uh, we took, um, grabbed anything of value we could out of the house. Um, we kind of assumed the studio I did, it's called Woodshed, mm -hmm. it's going to go. Right. And um, we didn't find out until the next morning that it survived the fire. We got out of here, stayed in a bed and breakfast that night, and um, that night, right before we went to bed, uh, my son sent us a clip that somebody had sent him recording the news on his iPhone of our house burning. So, We're so, so we, that, yeah, yeah, you can yeah, show it. So yeah. that was like, okay, well, there it goes. Oh we saw the house burn. 
we assumed the studio was gone mm -hmm. because we knew the direction of the fire would have gone right through the studio to the house and didn't find out till the next morning when our son sent us another video where he'd come in with our son-in-law and another friend and they were they were going out putting out fires all over Point Doom. They Just formed an impromptu out, fire brigade mm -hmm. and saved a lot of houses. And <clears throat> somebody had told him, hey, I think your dad's studio is still there. He goes, no way. He had driven by and seen that the house was gone. They came over here, walked down through the rubble and found the, the studio had survived. And so the next morning I get this, you know, he sends us this video and we just, I just collapsed. Mm. You know, I, I didn't, like all that emotion right. just suddenly yeah. came out, you know, when I was sitting in the lobby of this bed and breakfast. Do you still feel it? Do you get emotional when you I you can, you want back? me to cry on cue? I, <laughs> I was hoping for my Oprah moment with you. <laughs> no, um, no, I would imagine that's just, this is a, a, your home. This is a yeah. place that you built basically yeah. with your own well, hands. Well, we built the way. studio, the, the house already existed, but uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was traumatic, definitely straight up. I mean, I had, uh, you know, all the news crews were driving mm -hmm. by and, you know, I'd be just, I came out the next day as well. I got out through the sheriff's lines. It closed off Malibu, but you know, if you know people, you, so I got in and um, news crews were like, they'd see me on the property just sifting through the rubble and they wanted that standard, so what was it like, you know, yeah. that, that kind of yeah. stuff. And I just, like, I just I, you know, what's going on in my mind is, can I curse? Yes. We'll you we'll, fucking we'll, vultures, you know, right. like, right. why, just go away. And then I said, one guy said, look, if you want the crying homeowner, go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I see this as an opportunity to rebuild and rethink, and that's what we're doing. Mm. So that's where, you, where you're at now. Uh, is your home rebuilt or? You... No, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> but we do have incredible plans for what we're going to build. Mm -hmm. But the studio survived. So there is video of this show. There, you can see it on YouTube a little bit. We will put up video. But for the radio listeners right now uh, that cannot see what we see around us, Richard, yeah. how would you describe Woodshed recording and what makes it different than every other recording studio because it because this is what were you told you can't do that over and over and over many and times, you did it yeah by many particularly my business manager <laughs> said no you can't spend that much money you can't do it he kept calling my wife and said tell him to stop you have to stop him we started with a budget and, and you know the the line is always you know in construction you're going to double it i quadrupled it wow so yeah we spent way too much money on this place but i didn't want to I, ha I could do it, barely, but I could, and I did, and just rethought how a recording studio works. But I did it for my own purposes. So describe what it looks like to you. And yeah, then you're, describing and then you're it to, to somebody who has no video right now. It's a modern craftsman, in, in craftsman architecture mm -hmm. style, but it's a modern take on that. And recording studios typically have no glass there's no windows anywhere for acoustic reasons and i didn't there was we have this amazing ocean view which you can't really see because it's going to blow out with my my camera here but that there was no way i was going to block that there view. are windows all around us They're all around wall, yeah yeah, yeah. So. 360 degrees is you know you feel like yeah. you're in nature and we are right we and are we in feel, nature uh by the way i think it's funny to me that we're all sitting, anybody that looks at this, and they're gonna see this Brady Bunch tile yeah. in here. <laughs> and it makes it look like we're zooming in from all over the world, just so everybody knows, we're all right here. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, all of the music I wanna mention in the show, there are 14 songs in this, this, these two, part one and part two, and all of it was recorded here. And as I was putting the soundtrack together, I noticed that most of the videos, I clicked on the videos, all you know, Coldplay. Um, yeah, they're they're filmed here. Yeah, and of course they would be. Yeah, yeah. yeah we we should get a lot of people to come here that didn't record here and film video to make it look like they recorded. Here. <laughs> we charge them a lot for that. Yeah. You, should. <laughs> you should. You should. <laughs> they should. Sign well, the way the... that it's built and the and the landscape it really is inspirational. I, I can imagine that anybody who's cre right? yeah, yeah, creative artist. would just feel so inspired. 
Well, to, and to answer the unasked question of how did it survive the fire, I have to give credit to the landscape, and the credit for the landscape goes to my wife, Linda, who studied and teaches regenerative agriculture and permaculture and biodynamic farming. And this, the, the grounds down below the studio and immediately around the studio were her, kind of her experiment grounds, and she uses it for teaching. And who, she didn't study that to make it fireproof, but it turns out wow. that yes. saved. Wow. None, of this, none of these trees burned. Does, so is, Interesting. has she taken what she's learned to, to, to people she's in teaching. the industry? She, that's, that, she'd be here right now, but she was, she's teaching at a, a, a class in Hollywood right mm -hmm. now, in Hollywood Hills. So back to the before, when this was just ground, it was dirt and shrubbery and, and trees. My, my wife would say soil, not so, dirt. Okay, yeah, go ahead. I, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm glad in a way that she's not here because I, I knew I'd be corrected if she was. Um, searching for the right terminology what was the vision richard like before when you looked at this area where did you how did you see a place that was open that was bright airy that brought in the outdoors inside um inspired creativity these huge artists some of the best biggest artists of the world right. have recorded here they come here they seek it out how did what was the I vision built it for them they found it they came after so you I built, built this for, for yourself me. as a composer, a film composer, and yeah. an occasional Artist. record producer. Mm -hmm. And I wanted something that inspired me. And uh, so we broke every rule, every rule of studio construction. Well, almost every rule. Yeah, but you knew, <laughs> but you knew in your heart as it, cause you're a composer and uh, I spent, I like, well, I'm also, you, knew you could do it. You thought, yeah, I'm also, I used to be a session player. I've probably played on a couple hundred albums as a keyboardist and, uh, if I gave out your bio, we'd, we would be here for three segments. Yeah, you, so we won't do that. But, but the point no, is... Uh, you can, but I just... No, no. I, I, it's I, amazing your I don't want to Google me. <laughs> 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 but but I, I didn't... Um, I, I just built it for me. I'd spent my life in recording studios, and I've... If you spend enough time in recording studios, you know it's kind of like being in Vegas. You're just like... <laughs> You don't have any concept dark of and time yes. or yeah. location or anything. It's it's off-putting. It's interesting. You anti-creative, right? It, and any audio work you do is that way. I mean, you, yeah. you have to go in for a film. You you're all in a blacked-out room. It's yeah. very. It's actually super depressing. Where, 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 right. Super I mean, when depressing. I when I go this is like, oh my god. Where are you going to do all your? I would, your, gonna do all I would your, learn to sing. You're going to do all your room. ADR here now, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I just figured it out. Yes, <laughs> you're going to sing a duet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you there and you Mariel. go. Yes, please. <laughs> so, Richard, this is, <laughs> I just think it's fascinating. And what were maybe a couple, one or two of, the, of your biggest uh, obstacles that you overcame as you were building? Business manager, thing? first and foremost. Business, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <just> money. <laughs> you know, money and, and uh, I didn't, there really weren't obstacles per se. It was just, well, since we're going into uncharted territory, I guess the biggest obstacle was fear that we'd finish it and it would suck, mm -hmm. right? That it wouldn't sound good, that we would have made some major mistakes. But I, I remember telling people, I said, I'm happy if I bat 700 at the end of the construction. But we batted 1,000. Everything we wanted to do, we did. Congratulations. Now, we, we also hired a studio designer as a consultant. We didn't let him draw, per se. Uh, I had an architect who had never been in a recording studio, had never even been in a craftsman house. He went and took a tour of the Gamble House in Pasadena, a couple of them took notes on how to do that, and we became really good how friends. How did he get the job? Uh, the right price? <laughs> well, he, I don't want to say That's that, but no, too. no, we yeah, got the yeah, job sorry. because he got the job because we hit it off. We just yeah. immediately were, saw eye to eye right. on what, what we wanted to do for this place. Mike Gormley, LA Personal Development. You've been in the music business many, many years. Grab your mic. Um, Mike, how long mic? have the Mike. two of you known each other? Oh, this you guy? And Richard, yeah. Your, your buddy there. Nin 1982. <laughs> Although I noticed you're not sitting yeah, very close. We met in 1982 when he was in Oingo Boingo and I was just starting to manage Oingo Boingo. I didn't know the guys in the band when I started managing them. <laughs> <laughs> seriously? No, seriously. Um, it's a long it story. <laughs> I'm sure it is. You guys got along? Did you get along at first? Oh, yeah. 
right away. Who, what's your name again? Who are you? <laughs> so well, you've we known Richard. No. Well, here's the thing yes. with Mike. There are the music industry is rife with stories of artists hating their managers at some point in time and suing them and being sued by them and getting it filled with that. Mike and I have remained friends. I don't know how, but we have <laughs> for all this time. I've, I've actually remained friends with many of the Boingo members. Are there any? One. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't want to get off track here. No, right? no. Okay. <laughs> Are there any life? <laughs> <laughs> um, I ain't talking. A good friend of mine, Larry Vigon, designed. I was looking at all the album covers that he designed for you. Larry Vigon, the artist for Oingo Boingo. Well, I don't know. I, I didn't. That was Danny. Like, there's like a, Bailiwick. a Danny Elfman. I don't. Which one did he do? There's like six of them, I think, if you look at his website. Yeah. That might have been. I'll, I'll show it to you. After. Okay. I, I don't mean to throw. Album so, Mike, you guys have been friends. So, the, if you were friends Mike's since Oingo Boingo. You knew Richard when he had the vision of building Woodshed Recording, um, and and you let him do it. You let him. Do it. <laughs> well, yeah, and his business manager hates me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Was the business manager calling you and his or wife? Or hated you then? Now, but, now, now it, thinks you're a genius. Out a yeah. Bit. <laughs> At that point, Mike wasn't. No, Mike, I wasn't a. We really were in around. business together. We were just friends. Yeah. So. So I didn't. I don't. I don't know when I first heard about this but I uh, I remember when I first saw it I couldn't believe it you, you had a party you came to the grand <laughs> opening party yeah. we had a, a party beyond belief here we I decided like we spent all this money on the studio I might as well do a big party so we had a you can google these words later we had a gamelan ensemble inside the mm -hmm. studio we had a, a zydeco band Doug's band up by the house we had an avant-garde percussion ensemble called Glank out by the pool, and we had a 11 or 12-piece taiko ensemble out on the lower yard with a stage wow. and lights. And I had them all timed every 15 minutes. They would take turns playing oh, to cool. force people that's to walk cool. around the property, yeah. right? It was, it was genius until the cops showed up. <laughs> <laughs> Which was probably within 10 minutes. It, it pretty much was. <laughs> yeah. And it was like at 7 o'clock at night, the cops showed up. So why are you complaining anyway? I don't know why. You just, you just reminded me of something. What's that? Uh, when I went up, up the steps there a little while ago, Doug yeah. called me, Doug Lacey, yeah. Doug Legacy. Yes. I said I'd call him back in five minutes. Yeah. Nothing. <laughs> oh, well. Do you want to make a call now, Mike? Yeah. No. We'll just wait. We'll listen. No, yeah, we want to we'll listen. listen. Yes. <laughs> Doug's a great, uh, great musician. Yeah, this, that was, uh, the Zydeco band was his. That's why, that's the connection. That's where he said, when he said Doug, I went, Bing. Yeah, yeah. That was, what do you uh, admire about Richard and, and uh, just his Nothing. His, his vision? <laughs> it's only a good friend. Said, it's yeah. mutual. It works out well. <laughs> But I, I mean, sitting here, I really feel the um, there was a deep vision, at, or, or maybe it just happened. I mean, do you feel like you're in a place that is nothing was a mistake and everything was thought out? I was, it's like perfect, isn't it? And it's you genius. haven't, so you I haven't mean, seen. Really there's genius. things you haven't seen, I don't, and it's you know, I know we're in radio here, but they can move walls in here, and they could um, they could take a corner of the studio and isolate it. And the rest of the studio isn't being used, but that is corner is being used. I mean, the Coldplay used to, where we're sitting at the moment, Coldplay wasn't... Um, well, kind of behind you was the vocal booth, but we're going to be doing a visual tour later. Oh, well, you can tell them about it then. Yeah. So these, well, you can these, see that all the speakers are like, they're, it looks like Legos. Well, <laughs> the whole studio is like Legos. Yeah. Or Lincoln Logs. So at what, yeah, at what time stuck. at night, Mike, do these walls start moving? <laughs> <laughs> How really long, late. How long was the session? 24 <laughs> 7. <laughs> Richard's saying, the walls don't move, Mike. What are you talking about? <laughs> uh, no, there, it's, it's, it's just an amazing, uh, amazing place. I love, actually, I try to get people out here so Richard can give them a tour so I can live, hear the whole story again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's just great. So they, they, there are technical things. That, what's underneath here? That uh, Maybe it's getting too technical, but underneath is all uh, wiring and everything, right? Well, there are. Oh. I, don't know. Well, I went off. And I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Technical difficulties. Yeah. All right. uh, those are um, they're wiring Mary troughs Conway. <laughs> and wiring um, the conduits that are eight-inch conduits. That is a but when you when you go into a normal studio, 
There's wires all over the place. There's, 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 you're oh, yeah, I don't allow them, that. You're tripping over them. You're, I don't well, allow and that. This place is clean. Can I tell a personal story here as, as a newbie yeah. okay. at the Woodshed Recording? I was told that I no wires, not even That's a right. cell phone wire or anything. And we have moved in, and there are wires there are everywhere. So many wires. And I can <laughs> well, tell you guys brought them over there. Yeah. Yeah. Richard, I'm so sorry. We yeah. broke rule number one. <laughs> right. We bro broke rule. No, I, Mariel, uh, Mariel Hemingway, the Mariel Hemingway Foundation. Um, you have done a lot of work. You're an activist, but you've done a lot of work uh, bringing resources to 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 people that that need them that maybe not don't ask for them um, and and work on mental health awareness and you help people in that way and I know musicians is one of the areas that that you work on and well I think anybody I, I mean I come from an art uh, an incredibly artistic family my grandfather bring Ernest Hemingway but I think anybody in the arts somehow there's this there's this incredible balance that ha that takes place between creativity and the balance of the mind, you know? And I think when one can't handle the stresses of life, trauma, upbringing, whatever, then addiction happens. And I think that happens a lot in, in the music industry. It certainly happens a lot in the, you know, the entertainment industry in mm -hmm. general, you mm -hmm. know, acting, actors. Uh, not being able to handle that. And so I think I just have an innate kind of understanding that uh, it's, an, it's an imbalance. Uh, it is an illness, but it's an imbalance of being able to handle situations that, that other people maybe are more prone to be able to handle. And I was thinking about, you know, what you do here and, you know, Mental health has a lot to do with light. The fact that you're doing something creative with singers and, you know, and you're producing them in a light-filled room is a huge, it, 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 what, it's a huge statement of how everything in, that, in, in the industry needs to change. Because when you think about it, so many times artists are in dark rooms, doing these things for hours and hours and it's very depressing. And then they, you know, then they may suffer from a addiction and, you know, start drinking and, you know, and drinking is a depressant and, and what have you. So I just commend you on creating something that I, I'm not sure that you realize the power that would have in the mental health industry. I, you know, I can't claim foresight. But in hindsight, <laughs> yeah, I, right. I'll, I'll claim it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Of course. So, so, and and I agree with you. About, the thing is, artists, actor, I include actors, directors, writers, um, certainly musicians, composers. We're product. Yeah. Right. And what we create is called content. Mm -hmm. That yeah. makes me nauseated. Nauseous. Right. I just yeah. like I cannot I stand that when people do that. And I stood that on its head right away and said, well, at least for me, I wanted to make a place that celebrates. That I love that you brought that up because it is so, it's so insulting to yes. call an artist a content maker. Yes. You know, like, okay, no, there's people out there that are doing digital content. Yeah. But it is, it's insulting as an artist who wants to create something magical. And the people no, that you brought in that, that you've managed that, you know, that, that have been inspired by this environment, that's, it, and these are artists. I, I, oh, Kellogg's fills their cereal boxes with content. That's yeah. content. Yeah, this is <laughs> that's a, exactly right. This is not content. And your wife yeah. has good rich soil making mm -hmm. not content, yeah. but actually nutrient dense food. <laughs> I, I, I used like to go that. to this networking group, and the guy had these, uh, you know, name tags, and he would put everybody in categories. Right. What they were, and my cat, and there was like businessmen, lawyers, all, yeah. and everything else. My category said content, <laughs> and I said no, 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 no. Oh, no. that's not going to happen. <laughs> and he said, well, that's the closest thing I have for you. So I borrowed a Sharpie and I put an accent on the second syllable so it became content. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Canton in French. And then there the, you go. <laughs> then the next time I came, I, I realized I could flip the card over and I wrote creator on it. And That's then awesome. After that, he got very mad at me about that. But after that, 
everybody everybody else that was there that was in our industry, yeah. we, how'd you do that? I said, Sharpie. And they borrowed my Sharpie, <laughs> and they all started doing it, and then he had to print out new cards for everybody. It's very so it's a important. little revolution. Got, yeah, it is a revolution, but people don't realize it's the small things that you do in your life. I talk about this a lot. Melissa and I talk about this on, on a podcast that we have a, about mental health. But it's these rituals of, that's self-care in a weird way. You, you knew that it was important. And also, you knew it was important for you, but you also knew that others would look at it and go, okay, this is the, this is the, I, oh my God, I'm an artist. That's, I want to be that. I'm a creator. I'm a, you know, I'm happy. I'm content in French. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, I reject the concept of suffering for your art. Yeah. I, I just flat out reject. I'm not going to like cut off my ear or, you know what I mean? <laughs> I don't, I totally don't knock over the iPhones. <laughs> no, I, I get very, I, no, I totally agree with you. I think that I think that artists have too long, and my grandmother might be a little bit to blame for this, because there was this tremendous amount of like suffering, courage, you know, bravery, yeah. walking a, a fine line between danger and you know, living life. And I think if he were to do it again, he would do it with joy. He would do it with happiness. He would choose a different path. Because I think he didn't, re I think there was a superstition involved in his being an artist thinking, oh, if I, if I like it too much. You know, I think as artists, we all have like superstitions. Like I, I don't want to look like I, I'm happy because then it'll like switch or something. I don't know. We do all kinds of stuff. Yeah, yeah. When it, the, shoe, yeah. the shoe would drop. Yeah, yeah. and I think era. that that's, so as lighthearted as that might seem, that's a that's another powerful thing that you just say. Look, I think that creativity is joy. Oh, I, creation I, is love, right? Oh, be oh wow, that sounded woo. -woo. Sorry. No, I'll, I'll, I'll go even <laughs> further. Is that that I feel like at the risk of sounding like a complete nutcase, this uh, what we do as creators of music of art whatever is that's the truest religion yeah right yeah and i do believe that organized religions throughout history have either co-opted suppressed whatever uh, in particular music yeah. but in the arts in general now they've supported it as well i had to recognize that but um you know, why, why are jazz musicians and blues musicians relegated to playing in strip clubs? Right. Why is that? Why aren't they playing in churches? I mean, they do in some churches, mm -hmm. in some right. cultures, but not right. in most. Right. The Taliban cuts off your hands if you play music. They kill people for playing music, right? Right here in Malibu, the Church of Christ, the Pepperdine University's Church of Christ, yeah. you are not allowed to play instrumental music in the chapel. There's no organ in any Church of Christ chapel anywhere. I never knew that. Yeah. What? Because it, it is not of God. It's only, only the human voice is considered. Well, what's your, your approach to this? Wow. Being, music being akin to religion, the true religion, is not, too, is not far fetched from the Thoreau and Emerson approach to I see, why, why do I, how can I question the existence of God when I see it in every leaf and every, you know, this, this connection we have with nature? It's the same vibrational energy when you bring in music. When you're standing out in, the, in nature and you hear the wind and the rustling of the, the leaves, it speaks to the soul, which is exactly what. So I understand the tie into religion makes perfect sense. Oh, I can't wait to read a, some, kind of a, some kind of book. And it mentions me with Thoreau and Emerson. This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that was beautiful. But it's so yeah. true. It's so true. Before we move off the the topic of uh, being a commodity, an artist as a commodity, or you know, as a as a content provider, I think we have a a really unique opportunity with Ava Lynn here, who is just came off of NBC's The Voice, and you're a new artist starting out. And are you seeing? I mean, what would you say, Mariel, to, to Ava Lynn now? Um, you know, well, that uh, at the stage she's at, and are you experiencing? Well, I would say, like, does that, does it resonate, or does we sound completely out of our Yes, <laughs> no, 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 100%. With social media in general, it's all about content. And yeah. I've gone, and I've met a million, you know, music producers, just people in the music industry, and they tell me, you need this many followers in order to be considered, yeah. you need this Relevant. many, yeah, right. you need this much, you know, publicity, this, um, this many things, and 
Um, I do kind of envy some people that kind of grew up in the place where they just get to like perform and people find them there and, and not on social media because I think that you can create fake images and, and fake right. content, you know, and it's it's not what people are, you know, and it's not, I sometimes hate social media for that. Um, but even just coming off of a music show, you know, their whole job is to create content and create you as an artist and what they want you to be and the way that they want you to look and everything like that. Um, so yeah, it is difficult for someone that's growing up and wants to be a musician in this era, just with all of the music being on social media, it feels like it's not really in like everyday life anymore. It's all just, you know, on your phone or on your, in your headphones, you know, not like outside yeah. I think that's what makes it fascinating like when you think about the 60s or 70s and you think about these old bands and meeting up in Laurel mm -hmm. Canyon and there are like they spent you know probably in a very dark room <laughs> doing very dark things <laughs> but some great things but mm -hmm. just spending that time like really discovering it it's become so technical yeah but the good thing is about the voice and of course your incredible talent oh. when you're really talented it shows through like it even even with all this stuff when when yeah. you have a creativity and a voice like you're like you do it it does shine through and also if you have that understanding that in, in innate understanding that I'm an artist I um, you know stay true yeah. to being an artist it will always shine yeah don't you think no yeah. sure Speaking of talented artists, who are we about to listen to? That was recorded here at Woodshed. That's Recording. right. Yes, Ava. we're about to listen to Lady Gaga, which is nice. incredible. She's kind of someone that's interesting to talk about content because she kind of portrays herself, you know, as Lady Gaga, at least in the beginning. She was just, and you see her in A Star is Born way more as an artist and way more as a person. But it's interesting. I'm sure you saw her or met her or was around her. What do you, what can you say just about Lady Gaga, just for, you know, people that see her as, like, chronic? Uh, well, I think they need to rethink that. Yeah. That's all. I mean, it's, it's a, to me, it's a strong to call what I do, or Lady Gaga or anybody else do, is call me a content maker, <laughs> that's, that's an ethnic slur. That's just as strong as any ethnic slur you can throw at somebody. It's like, no, no, you obviously have no idea what I do. Mm -hmm. And many people feel that way, but they don't say it because they're out in the public sphere. I'm not, so I don't really care. <laughs> so I'll just say what I feel. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, she's been here a few times and done different projects here. Yeah. That uh, uh, it could happen to you. That one. Tell it happens to you. Yeah, I was yes. going to say, what a perfect title for this conversation, yeah. right? <laughs> um, uh, before we go to break, though, I think I, I just I thought this was really fascinating that we got into this a little bit. Mike Gormley, you you have been a part of that machine. You've probably seen it in every stage, from your days as a journalist at Cream to developing Rod Stewart, working with Oingo Boingo on and on rush what would what do you see do they does, does a person like Ava Lynn who's starting out still need to jump through and hit those those marks in the music industry or has it changed at all well it was funny when the internet first came along and it, it looked like an opportunity for everybody that was going to you couldn't you, you couldn't get to the big shots or you couldn't get to an audience you you had to work and work and play little bars and work your way up so i was saying, i remember thinking this is an opportunity it's turned into a horror show because it's so much going on that you're blocking your own mic your own camera shot oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was strategic that was we're, strategic. we're, we're, we're oh, trying to get content here. <laughs> I thought your dog had jumped on the table. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's it's. Um, thank you, Richard. It's. Um, You're so handsome, Mike. I don't want to get lost. We can tell old friends. <laughs> Harass each other. Uh, anyway, it's. It's now to me anyway. It's so it's so many people, so many things going on, and you know they talk about how you, you can break through and. It becomes viral, and I, I don't know. I don't know if there's somebody manipulating that, or if it really is natural. Mm -hmm. If it really is natural, 
it's great if it happens, but it's not fair. <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. you can't because so marketing is getting someone's talent out it's in front of people. Marketing now is social media and all that stuff, and, and it can work. But I think I think in a way it's made things a little more difficult for people because now everybody can make a record. Mm-hmm. Everybody can uh, uh, demo a. An acting thing. What do they call it? An acting? <laughs> a uh, oh, do a, a, an audition? Or yeah, audition yeah no. Audition. I, oh, I know. There, there was a now we don't, now we don't reel? even go to an audition anymore. You just do it on your right. iPhone, right? And you send it in as Slateable. And hi, I'm but so you know, and, so. and, and there's these stories really of tall. people who. <laughs> a lot of per- you can get personality, a feeling for a person that way. Recorded nothing <laughs> or recorded in a basement somewhere and, and ended up getting through the crowd it does happen yeah. every once in a while but it, just look at the people who come to this studio that we're sitting in is a is a is proof that you got to have this kind of venue this kind of um uh, studio to come into i guess if you can i mean there's one one thing is the a lot of studios charge a lot of money you don't charge a lot of money. You charge you same for everybody. <laughs> no, I'm, t- I'm telling you. I'm trying to be nice. <laughs> uh, purposely, no. But I hate to be... Are you, are you finished with the sentence? Or I don't want to cut you off. I guess I am. <laughs> <laughs> no, finish. I'm sorry. So you don't... No, it, 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 it's, it, I have finished, you know, basically. My, by the way, Mike, that's a, if someone wanted to book a, a session here, they'd talk to you, right? Not me. No? They talk to me. They talk to Dr. you? Dr. Richard. Because he would raise the rates and take, take a cut. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't have the mic. Well, basically, you're saying, though, that I could become a singer if I wanted to. <laughs> Even you though I don't. Could. You actually I mean, I could, could because I'm tell- there's... there's uh, Do um, I? Uh, no, I'm telling you. Technical <laughs> equipment can make anybody's voice wonderful. Yeah. And I, uh, some uh, people use it. Uh, I'll t- very quick story. That if somebody spent some time Googling, they figure out who I'm talking about, but I won't say her name. <laughs> but she was a huge pop star back in the day, mm-hmm. and we worked together on a show, but she wasn't known as a singer. She wasn't a singer. Oh, she was a dancer. And she came to me mm-hmm. one day and said, hey, I've been offered a contract with Virgin Records. And I said, oh, God, I'm giving away way too many clues. Yeah. And, and I we said, got it. And, and I said, <laughs> I, I, she goes, what do you think? And I go, well, are you a singer? She goes, no, I'm not a singer. I'm a dancer. And I said, don't worry. We'll, they'll figure it out. That, that can be done, right? At that time, autotune was just coming right. into play and harmonizers. And, and I don't even think they had autotune, but you, with a harmonizer, it was a crude version of autotune. Wow. And sure enough, she number one hits, huge hits. And her videos looked amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Right? <laughs> wow. It's, it's going wow. way back. It's, it was echo chamber that covered up bad voices and so on. Yeah. Maybe you'd, you'd hear these records and you would think, we're in the middle of a cavern or something, but it was it was just to cover up the... You're, trying, right? you're putting reverb on me later, right? Mm-hmm. This is your post, in post. Okay. Uh, already now. We're not letting you sing. <laughs> Thank, no, Lord uh, knows. With the conversation about marketing and all that, it's probably a bad time to bring up. We need to take a commercial break. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we are at Woodshed Recording with Richard Gibbs. He's a composer. He's a musician. He's a producer. I want to call him the visionary, and I, I think everybody here at this table would would back that one up go to woodshedrecording.com and check out more you've got to check out the photos of this place um check out the invisible arts podcast with host richard gibbs on apple podcasts and you can find richard gibbs on his website at richardgibbs.com and on instagram at i am richard gibbs and on, <laughs> and on a good day out in the water surfing and most of the time in the water surfing or recording beautiful music or working with great musicians. The music soundtrack today was entirely, entirely recorded here at Woodshed Recording. And uh, I want to mention that Ava Lynn Thurston has a beautiful voice. I'm talking about beautiful voices. She's going to play at the end of the program here. So stay, stay around for that. And we will be right back. Ava, tell us and remind us who we are listening to going to break. Lady Gaga, till it happens to you. We'll be right back.
Jeremiah show, we just came back in with Coldplay Adventures of a Lifetime recorded here at uh, Woodshed Recording, which we were sitting here in the middle of the recording studio with owner Richard Gibbs, which had recording Mike Gormley has grabbed his mic and taken note, it over. It's, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but was Coldplay in this room when the fire hit? They had it booked. They had a book, but they weren't actually here. I thought for Chris this album, for this song. All right, or? never mind. <laughs> that was good too. Um, so welcome back, Heather. We've, Heather has joined us here. Heather Dawson. She's the editor and the founder of California Life HD. Heather, welcome. Thank you, Jeremiah. This is absolutely stunning, and the exact stories that we look for on our show. So it's the best of California, and this is definitely the best of recording studios from everything that I've seen. And I just would love to know how it's changed over the years since when you first started. Uh, you, you know, as far as the process and all, it's pretty much been the same, but it, this, this isn't that long of a time period since we opened this studio. It's been 19 years. Um, and, you know, and, and we've always had just high-end clients, you know, pretty much all of them. Like, if you look at the studio website and you see, you know, U2, Coldplay, Barbara Sam, blah, blah, blah. And you're thinking, oh, you're cherry picking. No, that's, that's it. That's our clientele. And that's who we get. So it, it's been good. It, it's been consistent. Have you seen a big difference just now with social media playing such a role and the younger artists wanting to come in and video and get behind the scenes and everything from even just oh, yeah. 19 years ago? Yeah, I mean, everybody, so many people come in now and they just assume they can bring a camera in and film while they're recording. And we tell them, no, you can't. Because this is a location as well. It's, we rent this out as location. And we say, you can, but you have to pay a location fee to do that, which always kind of throws people off a little bit. So those of you at home, you're seeing very expensive footage right now. <laughs> I don't think we're getting out of here. We have to do, have to do dishes or something? <laughs> yeah, we'll talk. Okay. Great question, Heather. Thank you so much. We're going to take another quick break. We're at Woodshed Recording with Richard Gibbs. He's a composer, a musician, a producer. Uh, check out his podcast, his Invisible Arts Podcast. He talks more about the fire and everything else and building the, the studio. It's great. Apple Podcasts, everywhere else you can find podcasts. And his website's richardgibbs.com. Instagram, I am Richard Gibbs. He'd love to be followed. <laughs> doesn't bother him at all and uh, the music soundtrack today was entirely recorded at woodland woodshed excuse me woodland uh, woodshed recording here and elise thurison is here she's going to what, what song are we going to listen to do you, you, do you remember we're going to break um yeah we're now about to listen to the chain smokers and cold play something just like this um richard i'd love to hear what it was like working with the chain smokers and Coldplay here. Are you a fan? Yeah. I, I don't know. I was surfing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the roster, if you go to the website, woodshedrecording.com, it's, uh, it's incredible the people that played there, yeah. played here, recorded yeah. here. Uh, does it ever, so you were out surfing. So, so well, you I see these people speaking, all the time. I'll, answer, I'll, I'll give a quick tour when yeah. they come here, and I'll give a quick tour for the people watching, basically what I do with everybody else. But then I'm out. I don't you let them have their space. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. they come in with their team, right? They yeah, come in general, with their yeah. producers and what, yeah. what have you. They don't, m most people don't come here because of me. They may come in spite of me, right? <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I don't, I stay away. I'll just make sure yeah, they're comfortable and yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm out. No, I get yeah. it. Right yeah. Yep. All right. The Chainsmokers and Coldplay. Something just like this. We'll be right back. Good. Cool. All right. So that's, then we got one more. Another short one, real short one. Who wants, who's got a good question for Richard? Melissa? That one? Mario? You got a good question for I got one if you give you down, probably. Do you have another question? Uh, I already did that. that was a uh, why, don't we cut, why don't we ask about the next? Do you want to tell a story oh, can, about Can that? I ask about his yes. the foundation, right? Don't you have a... Don't you oh, yeah. oh, he doesn't want to talk about it yet, though, right? Yeah, yeah. okay. Can I but ask about that? No. Did you want to talk? You sure. said, no, okay. okay. I mean, okay. it certainly ties into what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Come back. yeah. Okay. Welcome back. Mm -hmm. All right, ready? 
Here, Mike, you should take one. I'll take one. There you go. Three, two, one. Welcome back. We just listened to Pink, Raise Your Glass. Richard. Welcome back, Richard Gibbs. No, again, I'm welcoming you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping if I say it enough, you're going to think it's my place. <laughs> Fair enough. Mariel Hemingway. I Mariel have a Hemingway. question for you. Yes, ma'am. I... Um, as you know, I, ha I have a foundation, yes. and it's a resource navigator. Really, it's, it's just about having access to other foundations and places that are making a difference with mental health. And you are connected with the foundation. I started, it's not a foundation, it's a nonprofit. It's a nonprofit. It's, it's called Armory of Harmony. And uh, the short version of it, the elevator pitch, is that it's swords into plowshares. We acquire gunmetal from buyback programs around the country the police departments run. Mm -hmm. Wow. And we get the metal after the guns have been destroyed and then uh, uh, the ingots, as they were, and then give them to um, uh, instrument manufacturers to make musical instruments that utilize wow. u utilizing that gun metal and then give instruments to high school programs around the country. Okay, oh, you're great. just like... So right. You're too it's cool. Incredible. All right. <laughs> no, you're seriously yeah. too cool. Yeah. That was like yeah. for turning a gun into an instrument. Yeah. Forget sticking the Wait. daisy in the bottom of the barrel. We're doing <laughs> thing here. And for That's elite, amazing. You know, I mean, away music from schools, the yes. programs being canceled, that always frustrated me. You've, you're finding a way to get them. Well, but the link, the link that you're making mm -hmm. for, for, you know, for instrument from, you know, killing something to instrument right. to then to trial to, to turning it into artistry yeah. is really yeah, it, kind it, of it seems like your path is like your blood well mike's part of this initiative as well uh, and a bunch of other very amazing people have signed on to help out with this it's not really quite out in the public yet what we're doing uh, um but it's um it's, it's not, I always have to be very clear about this. It is not an anti-gun initiative. That's not the purpose of it. The purpose of it is to get people that are pro-gun to say, okay, here's something we can do positive mm -hmm. about this. Let's get kids, more kids into music. I, my my smart-ass one-liner about it is no clarinetist has ever shot up a school. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, right? At least to my knowledge. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's it's beautiful, and I I didn't take it as like oh you were making a big statement. I I took yeah. it really as the the alchemy of it, you know. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Well, one of the things we do at Merrill Hemingway Foundation, sorry, one of the things we do at the foundation is really trying to make the connection between the, uh, to find purpose. Mm. And, a, and a lot of times when people are coming to the foundation seeking out the help from Mary Laura Foundation, they're looking, they, they don't know what they don't know, and they don't, they're, they're not exposed to a lot. So one of our jobs is to expose them to as much, and they, oftentimes when they find out what's available, they're still trying to find a link to purpose. And, I, and this is one more connection to purpose and reason, and, it, and it, not making political statements, just showing purpose is really powerful. No, if, if I may, put, put our logo on your site. We'd love, we'd love to help. Absolutely. We will do it. Absolutely. We'd what a great it. collaboration. Armoryofharmony.com. We'll be right back, but first, Ava Lynn, who are we gonna, who are we going to break? Hear music. We're at, yeah, we're at, uh, actually, um, out of music? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it looks like Sean Mendez, but I could be wrong. No, no, no you're, you're uh, right. You're Sean Mendez. Yes, yeah, Sean Mendez yeah. in my blood. Oh, I have. Wait, tell, wait, tell I, the story. Wait. Very quick story. I was here when Sean showed up with his crew. I walked him down that walkway, came in, showed him everything. They immediately. Sean went right to uh, that blue, that light powder, we well, can't see it, but there's a powder blue guitar over yeah, there. My Picked eye it too. up, and I started handing all these odd instruments out to his co-writers. I said, oh, try this, try this, and they'd never played this. And right in front of me, within 15 minutes, they had the kernel of In My Blood. In 15 minutes of walking in. Wow. And wow. wrote it and recorded it here, so... That's a great story. I thought this song was really, uh, I, I thought of Mariel and the foundation when I heard this song, the lyrics, it was really, really touched me. We'll be right back. Okay, we're coming back in with Coldplay, him for the weekend. Um, you want to bring us in? Yeah. Bring us back? And this is a wrap up on this one. So this will end this first and then we go to the tour. Okay. Okay. Three, two, 
one. Welcome back. That was just Coldplay, Him for the Weekend. Who's that, uh, that distinguished gentleman off to your left there? <laughs> this is Richard Gibbs. <laughs> I think that's the first time that adjective has ever been applied to me. <laughs> I see you you rocked back in your chair a little. Well, yeah, I guess, yeah. I, we, find, <laughs> we stunned him. Um, Coldplay, I know they just, they were, like Mike brought up, Mike Gormley brought up that they were here before the fire. They, were, they had booked the place. Well, did they come back? Or? Well, specifically, Chris Martin. Uh-huh. Uh, rented this place on and off for three years. So he, I think he did all of the vocals for Head Full of Dreams here and, um, and wrote most of the songs here. And he would rent out the studio for you know, five days a week for months at a time. And one of my, my favorite Chris stories is when he first started working here and he would come over he, in, in the morning and start working. And, and our house was over there, right there. And my wife and I were sleeping in, and I started hearing music. I'm, like, oh, I'm trying to sleep. And we look out the window, and down in the garden was Chris Martin with an acoustic guitar working out a new song, singing. He's like, where else in the world are you going to get serenaded by Chris Martin? <laughs> and you complain know? about and, it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, dude, keep it yeah. down. So, <laughs> he did lead. He led with the complaint. <laughs> That's, That's awesome. awesome. <laughs> okay, so this has been an awesome hour with you guys. So thank you so much, Richard Gibbs, for being the host here. I'm going to give up on trying to convince him it's my place. Uh, <laughs> I'll let everybody know we're going to go to uh, we're going to take you out here with Julia Michaels, all your execs uh, or all your exes. Excuse me, my eyes are going really exes. bad, really bad. <laughs> this Perrier, the bubbles, something with the bu- wrong with the bubbles. Uh, such a fun conversation and I, I want to thank everybody for being here it's not over so part two we're going to take actually a tour of woodshed recording and then ava lynn is going to sing us a little song we'll, we'll uh, see you in the second half